You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Every episode, we discuss a new topic with a panel of creative professionals. Hi, I'm Cecil McPurry, President and Chief Creative Officer of Falcons. Welcome to another episode of Experience Imagination. I'm your moderator, Audrey DeLong. Today, we're going to talk about edutainment. As you might guess, edutainment is a blend of education and entertainment, but how and where is it utilized, and how does Falcons develop these sorts of projects? Our guests on this episode will explore those very topics and then some, but first, I am joined by Cecil McPurry. Hi, Cecil. Hi, Audrey. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Good, thanks. I want to talk a little bit about the history of edutainment, just to give our listeners an idea of where that concept came from and how it's evolved. My experience with edutainment stems back in the late 80s and early 90s. And back then, it had a bad rap. I think what was happening, it was not executed properly. And so I think that's one of the reasons why it had a bad Mm -hmm. rap. But it's such a perfect word to kind of combine those two words, you know? And so I feel like... It's a revival now in my mind. You know, we use it often because I think it's very clear to communicate that we're using entertainment to help elevate education and vice versa. And so I think Falcons has been fortunate to be able to embrace that word and successfully execute it. Yeah, I think revive is a great word. So later in the episode, we're going to sit down with Don Saccone, who is the vice president of PBS Kids Portfolio Partnerships Kids Licensing. Dawn will be able to share her personal insight into bringing an edutainment experience to the public. And we're going to also welcome Spencer Jones, who is a science program specialist at the Orlando Science Center. This is going to be a really fun conversation because it talks about the role that edutainment plays in museum exhibitions. First, though, we're going to kick off the conversation with our own Stephen Ricker and David Schaefer. And then, Cecil, we look forward to joining back up with you at the end. Thank you. Exciting. Great cast. I'm joined by two guys who are no strangers to the podcast, David Schaefer, Vice President of Falcons Creative Group. Hi, David. Hello. And we have Stephen Ricker with us, Creative Director of Falcons Treehouse. Hey. Hi, Audrey. Well, thanks for sharing your time with us yet again. Uh, We're going to talk about edutainment today. I want to first get into the conversation about what we do in this area. So give our listeners a couple of examples, if you will, David. So I think one of the unique things with edutainment is you can approach it from two different angles. We have clients that come to us that are squarely in the educational side of things and recognize that to have more success, they need to inch toward entertainment. And on the other side, we have clients that come to us that are in the entertainment industry and recognize that they want to be a little more fulfilling or have a broader appeal and want to make sure they have an education aspect. So we've done projects really from both aspects. For example, we've done a lot of work with National Geographic. Certainly, I think they are known uh, to be more on the educational side of things, but they're certainly a unique client because with their you know, channels and publications, certainly they're easy to say they're in the entertainment industry as well. So mm-hmm. I think we were a great fit with them. Um, our teams molded together really, really well, and we were able to continue the educational messaging, but through really fun and unique ways. Another example is the Heroes and Legends exhibit at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. There were elements to that that were, you know, 90% entertainment, 10% education, and then there were other elements that were the complete opposite, that skewed much heavier towards education and, and less on entertainment. It was really about giving and providing information. And I, I think having that mix and having that balance creates that kind of well-rounded, overarching experience. Which holds more power in the equation, education or entertainment, or are they equals? Well, I think they're almost two hemispheres, you know, the, the left brain and right brain that work in the best cases kind of seamlessly together. You know, I'm a big proponent that, you know, people are more open to new ideas when they're being entertained. You know, think about when we're in the movies or we're, you know, binge watching a riveting documentary series. We're emotionally invested in this experience. And we utilize that a lot with the kind of edutainment projects to marry both halves there. Mm-hmm. So people don't necessarily know they're being entertained. They're just engaged in the experience. And of course, part of the equation is storytelling, which we talk a lot about at Falcons. What role does storytelling play in an edutainment experience? 
I think uh, storytelling is key in our approach to edutainment. I think it is an avenue that allows you to tie in the entertainment aspect and, and still have those educational tones. So I think it's of critical importance in how we approach it. Now, you know, certainly there are other avenues to that, but I think story connects people to the experience. You know, it, it, the story can make it more personal or more real. And I think once you start to make those personal connections, it just makes it experience or the content that much more engaging and interesting. Storytelling played a big role in the Becoming Jane exhibition at the National Geographic Museum because we're talking about Jane Goodall, a real-life person, an iconic human being who's done so much for humanity and the planet. Can you talk about the beginning elements of how we worked with Nat Geo on that one? Absolutely. We really wanted to explore how she first engaged with chimpanzees in in the wild and what led her into um, exploring in this very unique way. A great example of how we use the technology to then tell the story um, would be in Becoming Jane, using that immersive theater, which uses the stereo 3D projection Mm -hmm. to actually put the guests into Gombe itself. Completely engrossing. Absolutely. You're completely enveloped uh, within the environment, just as she was. What are some of the things that Falcon specifically brings to the table, David, when we design these special guest experiences? We've been talking a lot about how the the story can lead the way, but I think one of the skills Falcons brings and and we're really strong at is how we blend that with technology. And, you know, we've said it time and time again, we don't like the technology being front and center or being there just so we can market the technology. It needs to support the intent of the story and of the topic. And I think that's something our team is really proud of. We've been able to uh, work on, you know, multiple experiences that were world's first type things, um, you know, that were truly kind of cutting edge. And that was done not because we wanted the headline to be world's first technology on something. It was done because our team brainstormed new and awesome ways to uh, you know, share those stories and share the content. And I think that's something that is kind of synonymous with uh, Falcon's creative group and something I'm just really proud of. A lot of families visit these edutainment experiences. What are some of the tricks of the trade to keep those really young guests entertained for hours sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where IP can come into play. I mean, really, when you think about some of the brands out there that children are in love with these days, there are some really great ones that have strong educational components to it. And I think the reason that exists is because there can be a a connection to the IP or the brand. And so now it becomes more entertaining for the children and it just makes the education that much easier. So I think when it comes to the children, you maybe need to lean a little bit more into the entertainment and, and if you will kind of almost trick them a little bit into the education. (laughs) But I think that's very achievable and something that we were able to do by having the right type of touch points or the right type of experiences that we know they're going to have a blast at. Ensure there's an enhanced uh, accessibility to the messaging. Yeah, it's not spinach. It's just a different looking type of Cocoa Puffs. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, guys, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Audrey. And Stephen, stick around for our next conversation. Absolutely. I have the pleasure of welcoming to the podcast Don Saccone, who is the Vice President of PBS Kids Portfolio Partnerships, Kids Licensing. Thank you so much for being here, Don. Thanks for having me, Audrey. Well, before we dig into the topic, what is your favorite thing about working with PBS? Well, that's an easy one. Um, it's definitely the producers. I've been working with PBS and PBS Kids producers for over 15 years and they are so talented. Let me give you an example. Mm-hmm. Nova began producing science programs way back in uh, 1974, but what still sets them apart today is the way they deliver an experience. They tell stories in such a way that makes us want to be more curious, and the same thing is true on our kids' side. I love that the shows inspire curiosity, whether it's how to solve problems, like Eleanor Wonders Why and Odd Squad, or curiosity about animals, sea life, habitats, like wild crats. They know how to bring viewers into every episode so that viewers feel like they're part of the experience. And after 15 years, I'm still in awe over what they do. So that's why that's uh, the best part of my PBS experience. 
Well, it is all about the storytelling, just like us. I mean, you have to draw those viewers in and keep them immersed. Absolutely. Which kind of brings me to my next question here. For the first time in PBS's 51-year history, believe it or not, PBS and PBS Kids shows are expanding into a physical brick-and-mortar destination, which is what we're talking about in this segment. Why now, Dawn? We're seeing so much growth in digital games. Games give kids a new way to engage with their favorite characters, and it's active engagement. So for the producers, extending the reach of their content to a new platform like a brick-and-mortar destination, it's super interesting. They love the idea of giving kids and parents a way to immerse themselves in the worlds of their favorite shows and characters where they can truly be part of that experience. So that's really interesting to producers. And I think it's going to be really exciting for kids and parents too. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways to tell these stories and a lot of variety, which we're going to get into later, but I I wanted to ask Stephen here first, before we get into specifics, what does a guest see when they walk into this amazing space? There are four portals that act as gateways into different avenues of experiences. One for technology, one for science, nature, arts, all of these experiences on on what we call the curiosity spectrum. So from there, they would enter through the portals and really start to engage and begin their own journey of of kind of self-exploration on different subject matters, different experiences. Yeah, so you talked about those four elements. Those are kind of the roots of the experience. So what are the branches? You know, everyone's very familiar with the STEM concept in academics with the science, technology, engineering, math. But we've wanted to uh, kind of expand that. So we created this, what we call the curiosity spectrum, that everything from very immersive media-based experiences to very tactile, very explorative, hands-on experiences. Yeah, and I'm guessing it has to do with the IP. So I want to go back to Dawn and ask her, how, how many different IPs will be represented? And, and can you talk about some of the specific ones? Yeah, we have the Jim Henson Company properties, Dinosaur Trains, Sid the Science Kid. We have one of our newest properties called Eleanor Wonders Why. It's all about problem solving and curiosity. We also have Super Why, Wild Kratz, Xavier Riddle in the Secret Museum, and, and many more. So it's exciting. Yeah, so it touches upon different age ranges, I'm guessing, those IPs? That's right. We have some shows that are squarely in that uh, three to five range, and others go up to age nine, ten. Okay. So, Stephen, I I wanted to go back to you then and ask um, specifically, if, if there's different locations of these Curiosity Playgrounds, how different will they be? Will they incorporate all of these IPs? So the goal when we roll out um, these multiple locations is to you know, offer a core experience that is, is both uh, kind of the same, but also have opportunities for differences between locations. Especially with different experiences, uh, we can kind of rotate out things and uh, continue to allow families to kind of learn and explore new and exciting topics over time. Don, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to executing for the first time at Curiosity Playground? I believe that uh, we're all curious kids at our core and regardless of age. So imagine, Audrey, I think if you had an opportunity to see what it's like to run as fast as a cheetah, like in wild crats or soar like an eagle or float around in space and really feel what it's like to be there. I mean, who hasn't dreamed of doing some of those things? Absolutely. So having the opportunity to bring some of the best shows to life where kids and parents can immerse themselves in those worlds, I mean, that just takes engagement to new heights. To me, that's what makes the Curiosity Playground so exciting. So Dawn, you've talked a lot about the producers, and that's that's the producers for the PBS Kids shows. Uh, how would Falcons directly interact with them? The PBS Kids producers are really collaborative. Any way that they can be involved in the process will be really exciting to them. And they'll bring a wealth of experience to really help to elevate some of these ideas that we come up with. We're planning on powering Curiosity Playgrounds app with Aeon XP ecosystem. Isn't that right, Stephen? That's right. It is such a a truly exciting um, ecosystem, which really connects the guests with every step in their journey. It allows them to not only track their progress, but really expand the guest experience from 
not just the venue itself, but uh, outside of the venue, on their way there, uh, at home, you know, after school, on the weekends, to really create this larger holistic experience. You said track your progress. So give us an example of one of the things that might be at Curiosity Playground that, that would actually have progress. We talked about the different portals on the Curiosity spectrum. Mm -hmm. So if a guest is more interested in technology and science, they can track their progress through there, but can also see, oh, hey, I can connect and get some additional points if I venture outside of my comfort zone, if I try something more artistic or looking into the more of the, the nature aspect of things, and seeing also how that can relate to the technology and science or the other items on the spectrum. It really gives each guest a lot of personalization in their experience with the opportunity for upgrades within the ecosystem or even, you know, rewards, um, you know, digital rewards or, or mm -hmm. even physical rewards and a way to really customize the experience around them, both in media or maybe in a, you know, a physical aspect as well. Yeah. Dawn, have you done a little reconnaissance, let's call it, at other family entertainment centers to see how they've designed and structured the guest experience? Yeah, I have. One of the things that I, I've noticed and why I think we're so excited about this curiosity spectrum is that so many of the activities are very, they've really been structured linear and there isn't a lot of that cross-pollinization and they also just aren't as immersive and engaging in a way that I think our producers, based on the, you know, we try to be best in class. And so that's one of the things we're really excited about with Falcons is to be able to work with you on this to where we can deliver these experiences that I don't think are being delivered in the same way, which is really exciting. Yeah, there's a lot of ways that we can enhance the guest experience, and, um, and we're really looking forward to seeing how that comes to fruition in our Curiosity Playgrounds with you. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things that Stephen had mentioned, which uh, I think is really interesting, is that, in essence, guests can take this experience home with them through the app to be able to have some engagement there. And that's another exciting idea of being able to come and to have repeat visits, but also be able to have that experience at home as well. And I think the properties will be able to really bring this whole curiosity spectrum to life because we do have layered learning. The shows are never just about one thing. There's always the crossover. So that's exciting too. Well, Dawn, this has been a real treat. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thanks so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay, great. And Stephen, thank you as always. It's always a pleasure. Before we get into our next segment with Orlando Science Center's Spencer Jones, I want to talk about our connection to this top-notch museum. Our director of technology here at Falcon, Saham Ali, and our senior interactive designer, David Consolo, have presented at Orlando Science Center's Otronicon event, which brings together experts from around the region to discuss science, technology, engineering, and math. And the goal is to provide practical, real-world information and experiences to attendees of all ages by explaining even the most complex matters in a clear and engaging way. Our next guest is a master at doing just that. Spencer Jones, welcome to the podcast. Hello there. Super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we're happy that you can join us to talk about this exciting topic. Um, first of all, I want to talk about what you do at the Science Center. You are a science program specialist at the Orlando Science Center. I said the word science twice, so I'm guessing that means science has something to do with your job. What do you do on a daily basis? All kinds of science. You're exactly right. I, basically, anything that a guest experiences as they walk into the building is through our visitor experience department. And I'm one of the specialists that specializes in the tech stuff and the programming aspects, so live theater shows and digital content and things like that. So really all kinds of things. My day-to-day -day is always changing, developing content, doing explosions, you know, liquid nitrogen experiments, you name it, I'm doing it. Yeah, well, kids' ears everywhere just parked up. I could do that for a living. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, right? That's, that's, what, that's our goal. Saham and David's presentation at Otronicon focused on augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality, otherwise known as AR, VR, and MR. You know, those tools are key components of the latest technological renaissance. They've really impacted so many different industries in a positive way. But we want to know how the Orlando Science Center uses them. You know, learning is really something that relies on different learning styles and different senses. And so being able to immerse people using mixed reality, virtual, and augmented reality 
is a key component of that going forward. So we've got some things with projection mapping. We do have a virtual reality lab where we mostly focus on flying jets, but we can mix it up to you know explore a cell or jump into a black hole, things like that. And then there is some augmented reality things too, even just simple iPad stuff, being able to pull up the Curiosity rover on an iPad screen and see it there in our dinosaur exhibit really gives kind of physicality to the objects that are really hard to grasp for people to really grasp the scale of the object or the complexities. And so using these mixed reality tools are, are just super important and, and they're becoming more and more prevalent year after year. Now that must be really exciting when, when especially younger kids come up and there's like an augmented reality or a virtual reality experience. Do they seem to grasp onto those things right away? Is it intuitive enough for them? Yeah, that's one of the weird things, right? That kids just seem to grasp this tech way better than any of us adults do. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much right away. You know, you, you hand a kid an iPad at two years old and they're somehow already using it, going through the settings and everything. And it applies to AR and VR as well especially with the VR lab that we have here, a lot of adults will struggle with it at first, um, trying to get it right on their head. They don't realize that they can look left and right up and down to actually experience mm. the entire thing. But kids go in and right away, they just get it. I think it's because their brains are still developing, right? So they're developing alongside the technology and they're definitely just understanding it on a base level. You know, so I want to talk to you about this quote, Albert Einstein. He's one of the greatest physicists ever, but he was also a genius at coming up with these great quotes. And one of my personal favorites is, play is the highest form of research. Now, to me, that means edutainment definitely has a big role to play in helping shape the minds of the next generation. What does Einstein's quote mean to you? Kids, when they are playing, they are doing science. And we don't often think about it in those terms. Science is really about, you know, exploring curiosity, figuring out how different functions work in our universe. And kids are doing that literally all the time. So a lot of it doesn't feel like science. We're not talking about chemistry. We're not talking about engineering specifically. We're playing with how different waters mix together to make different colors, or uh, we might be playing with blocks, something as simple as that. That play is allowing them to form the connections in their brain that this block balances on this block really well, which is kind of like the fundamentals of engineering, right? And it also is exactly what our mission is, which is to inspire science learning for life. It's not always about teaching the science in the moment, but to inspire people to appreciate and respect and learn science throughout their entire lives. And so absolutely that play is the highest form of research is a really cool quote. I think it leads into all that. You know, I'm sure it's a long and involved process to take an idea for a new exhibition and turn it into reality. Can you walk us through some of that? One is that we have different kinds of exhibit experiences. We have a traveling exhibit, which we purchase for three to six months and it rotates throughout the year for us. And then that traveling exhibit, once it's done here, will go somewhere else, and then it'll travel to a different city or different state, uh, even sometimes different countries. But we also love developing our own exhibitions, of course. And that can range from just an exhibit piece, uh, one little thing that goes inside of a hall, uh, to giant multi-million dollar projects that span tens of thousands of feet. We have an entire exhibition team. We have a different fabrication team that works on the pieces that we design. Mm -hmm. uh, but to me, the really fun part is our prototyping with guests. It's kind of giving guests that freedom. You don't want to prompt them at all. You want to just like let them self-explore whatever you're putting in front of them and then just kind of gauge how they react to what you're putting in front of them and really use that in the design process. Very cool stuff. Interactive exhibits. That's a big term. Uh, it gets thrown around a lot. But I'm wondering, um, when you hear interactive exhibit, what does that mean to you? Uh, it's a lot of what we do here. We want to hit all the different kind of learning styles. Some people prefer to listen to podcasts, right? And this is how they learn. Some people watch videos or some people really need to get hands on with a thing and actually use something to learn it. And that's, I think, what science centers and museums specifically get to offer. And that physicality really drills home concepts in your brain, even subconsciously that you don't realize. And so when you're having fun, when you're playing with these exhibit pieces, you're learning, you're developing these connections in your brain, even as an adult. And you really get to emphasize that edutainment aspect of this, right? You're combining education and entertainment uh, into that fun, catchy word. But it literally just is a thing. And interactive exhibit pieces, I think, do exactly that. They're, they're just the highest form of edutainment. How important, Spencer, is variety when designing an entire exhibition that's meant to be educational and entertaining uh, for all sorts of demographics? That's a, that's a big question. It's a big part of what we do here. And I've listened to this podcast a bit. I think it's a big part of what a lot of themed entertainment does. It's trying to find that common ground between toddlers and kids and teenagers and adults and seniors. You know, like 
all the way up the, the chain. We want to offer edutainment for everyone. And so we need that variety. But it often comes back as well to segmenting at times, right? Because we have a Kids Town exhibit or several exhibits that are designed for seven and under. And then we have exhibit pieces and exhibit halls that are designed for eight and up or events that are literally for 21 and up. And so segment things so that people know it's for them. Adults get to get a little bit extra silly because they know they're the only adults around. There's no kids around. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can really embrace that. And, right. you know, adults love our Science Night Live events that are exactly 21 and up. Our, our member base, our community here, really are families. When you do open an exhibition, do you personally get a chance to walk around the floor and see how people are reacting to it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's a big part of the, my, my job is kind of to evaluate, especially the live programs that we were talking about, uh, how they're working with guests, how they're responding to it. Uh, but it also is true with the traveling exhibits, especially because those are frequently switching out. We get several of those a year. We have a traveling exhibit called Rescue, which is pretty cool. It's rescue services, firefighters, storm rescuers, basically. It's a very, very interactive exhibit for all ages. And traveling exhibits are great because they're designed to fit in lots of different spaces. But our space is different than, uh, you know, the Frost Museum down in South Florida or any other museum across Florida or the States. And so making sure that all these exhibit pieces fit our demographic or our physical space is really important. So it's part of our jobs to go through and make sure and optimize all these different aspects of it. But it's a different thing when you get to watch hundreds of different people interact with the same exhibit piece in different ways. It's always a lot of fun. Well, Spencer, I just want to say thank you so much for spending time with us today. Absolutely. I'm, I'm so excited to talk about entertainment. I think it's a really big deal. So thank you for having me. And this, this was a lot of fun. Okay, well, everybody, if you're in Orlando, be sure to check out the Orlando Science Center's latest exhibition called Rescue through the end of summer 2021. All right, Cecil, welcome back to the table. I'm curious to get your thoughts on those conversations. Wow, I'm just impressed. <laughs> I'm constantly in awe every time. David was so spot on to flesh out further what edutainment is. And Stephen and Don talking about the PBS Kids Shows component and obviously how effective storytelling is as it relates to edutainment. And of course, the Science Center, wow, that was impressive to mm -hmm. understand how it actually relates to science as well. So, exciting. Very much so. We want to thank our guests again, Don Saccone, Spencer Jones, and Stephen Ricker and David Schaefer. And to everyone who listened to this episode, thank you. We appreciate you. And we hope you're back with us next time. Thank you for listening to Experience Imagination, a Falcons Creative Group production. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and share with your friends. To keep up with our latest news, visit us on the web at falconscreativegroup.com and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, please email us at podcast at falconscreativegroup.com.